All right, welcome everybody to Citizens Climate Lobby's February National Call. I'm so excited to see all of you here with us today. Please share where you're calling in from and how many people are joining you in the Q&A. That's so that all of us will be able to see it. While you're there, go ahead and share your proudest accomplishment from last month so we can celebrate with you. We'll read a few of these out loud, so don't be shy. I'm Stephanie Mungia, CCL Student Engagement Director, and I support our college climate advocates. I'm calling in today from Miami, Florida, and I'm so honored to be hosting this call today, exploring and celebrating our special approach to transformational advocacy. I wanna share with you two of the words that come to mind and that I use frequently when I describe the people I work with, all of us on this call, ambitious and courageous. In honor of our guest today, I wanna to share a passage from his book that called these to mind as I read it. I invite all of you to let your hearts and minds be filled with the stories that arise for you as I share this quote. If you're involved in actions designed to generate change on a grand scale, it would be strange if you didn't feel some doubt. If people's insecurities and doubts aren't showing up, then volunteers and staff are probably not being challenged to move out of their comfort zones, to learn new skills and evolve as more effective agents of change. I firmly believe that if discomfort arises while in the pursuit of a compelling vision, then it's usually a good sign. It indicates that you're probably on the path to progress. Fittingly, this passage is sandwiched between stories of overcoming discomfort in pursuit of a greater vision from both our founder, Marshall Saunders, and our former executive director, director Madeline Para. I'm sure you all had stories of your own journey as advocates come to mind as you listen to those words too. So I want to bring some of those stories into the room as best I can by sharing some of your highlights from the last month with you now. Please keep putting those into the Q&A so we can share those too. Our chapter in Naperville, Illinois held an amazing postcarding party where they wrote 500 postcards to environmental voters. Volunteers in two of our New Jersey chapters had letters to the editor printed in the Washington Post on the same day, which is an incredible accomplishment. We have folks joining us from San Fernando Valley in California today, and they're sharing that their best accomplishment is filling out our 2024 action plan and locking down the date for their electrification fair this Earth Month, which is really exciting. And we can't wait to hear more about how that goes for you, Cody. The Northland chapter in Minnesota held a snowman protest with more than 100 mini snow people, and their protest was covered in the local newspaper. And not to be left behind, many of you have been hosting these protests. Thank you for that. They're always so cute, and I love seeing them on social media. So our Whitefish Montana chapter and Ann Arbor and Mount Pleasant chapters in Michigan also held protests, did a great job with those. We saw some of those snowman protest photos in the video before the call, but if you want to see more, you can find them on our blog, and we'll make sure to put the link in the chat to the snowman protest photos and stories. We've got a few folks joining us from Raritan Valley in New Jersey. One of their chapter members had a letter to the editor published in the Washington Post. Wonderful. Amy, congratulations. The Delaware statewide chapter formed three new action teams last month. Wow. That is so amazing to see our volunteers self-organizing to do more and more climate advocacy and really contribute to addressing climate change. Linda DeLapp in New Jersey's Morristown chapter, another one that had an LTE published in the Washington Post. We've got Greg joining from my home chapter in CCL Miami, a ground zero chapter. Good to see you on here. This is just amazing. There are too many of these to share, but an amazing number of letters to the editor, um, three letters to the editor published in one day in Toronto. That is a huge accomplishment. Thank you all so much for sharing those. I hope all of you will continue to read the chat and celebrate your, your peers all across the country and across the world for the great work they've done. I also wanna add a few national highlights from the last few weeks. We surpassed our January goal of 10,000 messages to Congress about clean energy permitting reform. In fact, we smashed it. You sent 11,476 messages, outstanding. The Prove It Act passed the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. As a reminder, we've been supporting this bill since it was introduced last year. And then we did a special mobilization to call committee members before this vote. And it clearly helped. Two more senators on the committee jumped on the bill as co-sponsors after we started calling. And then the bill passed with bipartisan support. It actually got one more Republican vote than expected. So we can really see our impact and this bill is moving forward. 
We grew a lot internationally in January, so I'd like to take a moment to welcome some of our newest chapters that have held a chapter launch workshop or become active in the last month, all of them outside of the United States. Mbuea, the capital city of Cameroon, Juba, the capital city of South Sudan, Wakisko in Uganda, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania all had chapter launch workshops, and our chapters in Bucharest, Romania, and London, Canada both are in the process of revitalizing. I know there are lots of other groups hosting group launches or revitalizing all across the country, including a special shout out to my friends in Tampa, Florida, St. Joseph, Michigan, and Galveston, Texas. So keep up the great work in bringing more people into the movement. Finally, one last big highlight. We were looking at our volunteer numbers at the start of the month and realized we currently have more CCLers active and working in our chapters across the country than ever before. So despite all of these great wins that we've just celebrated together, unfortunately, a 2021 poll of over 2,000 young people aged 18 to 29 conducted by the Harvard, Kennedy, Harvard University Kennedy School's Institute of Politics paints a pretty bleak picture. The poll found that 52% of young people in the United States believe that the country's democracy is either in trouble or a failed democracy. Only 7% said that democracy in the United States is healthy. Now, this is the age group I work with and the age group to which I belong. It's troubling, it's understandable, relatable, but also, as we'll hear from our guests today, fixable. So I'm so excited to be joined today by Sam Daly Harris. In July 2007, CCL founder Marshall Saunders asked Sam to coach him on starting the first CCL chapters. Sam continued to coach CCL leaders over the next seven years. He also founded the Anti-Poverty Lobby Results in 1980, co-founded the Microcredit Summit Campaign in 1995, and most recently founded Civic Courage in 2012. The completely revised and updated edition of Sam's book, Reclaiming Our Democracy, Every Citizen's Guide to Transformational Advocacy, was just released on January 9th, 2024. Now, the book is equal parts vulnerable biography, roadmap to effective advocacy, and inspirational call to action. So Sam, thank you so much for all that you have done to help thousands of people reclaim their power and for joining us today. I also want to say an extra special thank you for this book. When I found out that I was going to be interviewing you, I was initially just astounded. I just thought this is such an incredible opportunity. Then I found out we'd be talking about your new book and I said, oh gosh, I've got two weeks to read a book. How is this going to work? But it was actually a complete joy to read and so helpful. And it was especially special. I know Ricky's got a, a photo he can put on the screen for us um, to see you in the midst of your book tour. So I know you're exceptionally busy, but um, thank you so much for, for spending a few hours with CCL volunteers and results volunteers in Miami last weekend. It was a pleasure uh, to hear you talk about your book and, and to be in that room and see the impact of your words. Thank you. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I have to warn you, my wife says, that when I get excited, I start jumping when I'm seated. So you may see me jumping in just a moment. <laughs> we will. We would love to see it, Sam. Bring that excitement, definitely. <laughs> now, you mentioned in the preface that you want your book to be a, quote, beacon of hope and possibility for people who feel brokenhearted and overwhelmed by the headlines they read. And you first wrote this book in 1994, but you revised and re-released it because the challenges our democracies face have worsened, as has the depth of our discouragement. Can you tell us the main message of your book and why it's so important for people to hear that message today? Great. Well, the main message of the book is transformational advocacy. And I make the distinction between transactional, sign the petition, transaction complete, and the kind of work that CCL does, which is transformational advocacy, uh, where you're train, encourage, and then succeed at doing things as an advocate you never thought you could do, like meet with your member of Congress and bring them on board to your issue or have a letter to the editor published uh, on something you care about. And so when you do that, you see, when you do things you think you can't do, you see yourself in a new light. You see yourself as a community leader, and why that message is important now, I'm gonna just read one of the questions. I was interviewed last month on 1A, NPR, and this was the second question that Todd Zwillick asked, and this is why this is so important. He said, I'm gonna read it. He said, the passive nature of our politics now, you can feel beat down by it. I mean, this is my career. 
and I feel beat down by it. It's much more in a, of an effort for me. I don't participate the same way others do because I'm a political journalist, but I do have to pay attention. It's a grind. It's a grind, Sam. I mean, you know that. What am I feeling? What's the way out of that? I'm not an activist, but you know what I'm saying. That's why the message is so important for people to hear today. Absolutely. And I think it's a good reminder, you know, as I shared those those numbers right at the top about how young folks especially are feeling about our democracies, that feeling is really widespread. It's not just young people. Many of us are feeling frustrated. And that's why we exist to enable those those breakthroughs in personal power, as you explained, Sam. Now, there's an idea mentioned a few times in your book, which is about the fear people have of making big asks. And I think this is a really big part of how we enable those breakthroughs. Um, but can you talk about what it means to give volunteers a big ask and why it's so important? Well, let me talk about briefly what exacer is exacerbated by that. So, for example, there was a, a, a study last year by the independent sector that found that 31% of nonprofits surveyed were doing advocacy or lobbying in the last five years. That's less than half than 20 years ago when they did only 31%, but it gets worse. Uh, the Congressional Management Foundation asked uh, advocacy experts, professionals, what their main form of advocacy was. And they said 79% said an online email letter was their main form of advocacy, but only 3% of congressional staff said that made a big difference. So we're mostly not getting advocacy from nonprofits. And so many of the ones who do want these online letters kind of thing, they just sign here and put your zip code in. And only 3% of congressional staff says that makes a big difference. And so th that all happens because most nonprofits and most nonprofit staff are afraid of making big asks of volunteers. So, you know, they're standing in front of 20 people to start maybe a chapter and they say, well, if I ask for too much, no one will say yes. So they make this little tiny puny ask and then people do these sort of puny things and nothing big changes. So, uh, you know, I know that Ellie's working with several cohorts on relaunching and starting new chapters. And, you know, they're making asks like commit to being on this monthly webinar. I know other groups that start with a four part new group training. That's a big ask. If people show up and get the training they need, it makes a difference. Absolutely. You have a really great story about a big ask that clearly worked very well in chapter five about Bill Barrett, uh, what a CCL's regional coordinator is, the regional coordinator for the Mountain West. In it, Bill describes how he stumbled across CCL's website when searching for information about carbon pricing. And so he reached out and he says, quote, the next day, Marshall Saunders, CCL's founder, called me on the phone and asked if I would come to DC and lobby with them. I felt that if I wanted to stand up for what I believed in, I had to go. I remember calling Mark Reynolds, CCL's executive director and saying, I don't know if I can do this, but he encouraged me. Now, Bill ended up being the meeting lead in a Senate meeting, and he says, I was shaking like a leaf. I think many of us can relate to that. But walking out of that meeting, I realized that this is exactly what we need to be doing, letting our leaders know what we want them to do. Can you talk a bit about, you know, now that we've set up this big ask point, why is it so important that regular people are using their voices to speak to lawmakers and meet with them directly? Why is that our big ask? Yes, well, let me point to something else in your question and then get to your yeah, question. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, Bill Barron reaches out to CCL and the next day, Marshall Saunders calls back. I remember talking to John Clark and he said, many years ago in the beginning, I reached out to CCL and the next day, Marshall Saunders called back. So there's something in this, the next day we called back. So we really want to honor that kind of uh, attention to people getting involved. Now to your question, why is it so important that regular people meet with members of Congress? Well, you remember I said that 3% of staff 
said those online petitions were really effective, but 94% of congressional staff said an in-person issue-based meeting with constituents made a difference or a very big difference. So congressional staff are telling us that in-person, face-to-face, on an issue with constituents makes a difference or a very big difference, 94%. So we need to pay attention to that. Wow, yes, that's amazing. I mean, when people tell you what they need, that's definitely worth it to listen. Sometimes, um, you know, it seems like treating people with respect and developing relationships, like the relationships we develop with our members of Congress and their offices, sometimes it seems like it's just not enough to break those financial incentives. And we're seeing a lot of questions in the Q&A around this already that support the status quo or to overcome the corruption that exists in our political system. How does the results model account for those challenges? And is it enough? Yeah, well, I'm, I want to say that part of the deal around the challenge is that so few people are participating and so few people are paying attention. And so the work that you do to bring new people in makes a profound difference. And we need to do that. We also need the groups that are working to get money out of politics to offer transformational advocacy to their activists. Because if we if we just have them doing online petitions, that's never going to cut it. The thing that I really want to say is uh, when I'm working with the group who's working with a member of Congress who opposes their bill or opposes their issue, I have them ask these three questions and ask them looking for assignments. For example, if the member of Congress said, well, if you could get the Chambers of Commerce on board, we'll go get the cha- look for assignments. Well, if you could get the mayors on board, go get the mayors on board. The three questions. One, we know you don't support this bill. What would it take to change your mind? Two, could you say more about that? Three, why do you think that is? It's essentially a deep listening exercise. And you're listening for assignments to go deeper, whether it's bring on the uh, the the um, religious leader of your member of Congress or the largest employer in the congressional district or other opinion makers? I have to say, as a recent graduate, I am a sucker for assignments. So thank you for, for phrasing those questions, framing them in that way. It is just so important that we continue to cultivate that relationship by following up, by listening to what, what they're telling us. Now, I have one more question before we get into the Q&A. So for everybody who is on, please continue to type in your questions into the Q&A box so we can get to them. Um, But it really is coming back to your book. I just thought it was such great storytelling because it includes many, many stories um, like Bill's from volunteers across results, CCL and other advocacy organizations. I hate to put you on the spot, but if you had to pick a favorite one from the book, which would it be? Okay, so is that love? Who's your favorite child? Is that <laughs> we won't take it personally. We promise okay. not to take it personally. So they're all my favorite, and a real favorite one is Ellie Sparks talking about sacred and profound. But since that's in the previous edition, and also in the new one, I'm going to do a story that's only in the new edition. And I would mention, from the previous edition, twelve chapters have been removed and seven new added in. And this is a story, and I'm going to put this on the screen. It'll take me just a a moment. Uh, This is, um, sorry, let's see if I can make this bigger. There it is. Okay, this is a story about um, Maxine Thomas. Uh, There's Maxine with her U.S. Senator Todd Young, Republican of Indiana. And Maxine uh, is uh, a woman, I always say, she's amazing. But we're all amazing if we find the right coaching and training. Maxine is amazing. She has a lived experience of poverty. And she joined a group called Circles for people motivated to move out of poverty. And her group discovered that they had a story to tell. And they looked around for a group that could help them tell their story. And she found results. And she eventually got a scholarship to a results conference in DC and borrowed luggage to go to the conference. And she goes to the conference, and uh, the night before the Hill visit, she learns that the earned income tax credit was going to expire. 
And the earned income tax credit is for working low-income families. Uh, and at tax time in 2020, the, a family would typically get $3,100 in a refund. I'm going to read what Maxine says after her first ever meeting with a member of Congress. The first congressional meeting on Lobby Day was with Senator Dan Coats and brought new ahas. He was there for the entire meeting. I can still feel it. I was a ball of emotions. It felt like an out-of-body experience. I was processing being in the meeting, and now I'm in an exclusive meeting. We're all dressed up. It was high level. The volunteers were polished and sharp, but I was scared. That's kind of all of us at that first meeting. But I was scared and worried whether I would say the right thing. I think it was Lisa who asked, would you like to say anything? I thanked the senator and said, I learned last night why I'm here. I didn't know I could come here from Indianapolis to talk to you, someone who represents us in Washington. I can't imagine what will happen if the EITC is taken away from families like mine. I'm able to take a deep breath and catch up on my bills because of the earned income tax credit. I look forward to tax time because that's the only time I can handle my financial burden. I like to take my kids to the mall to buy shoes without worrying if it'll take away from other bills. She goes on and at the end of the day, she says, I was euphoric. I was on this high and I felt like I was part of something revolutionary. I was euphoric. I was on a high and I felt I was part of something revolutionary. That is transformational advocacy and stories like that. In the previous edition, there was one chapter on CCL. Now there are three on CCL. I like to think that's because of the hard work we've all been doing to exactly. deliver more of those moments. Thank you so much, Sam. I'm gonna turn it over to Flannery to help us bring some of these audience questions into the space. All right, so I think we've got time for uh, at least two of them. So our first most upvoted question is from John asking, what do you think about the structural problems with our democracy, such as gerrymandering and voter suppression? Can we reclaim our democracy without addressing these structural problems? Yeah, so I was asked that question in a pre-interview for 1A, and I said to the, uh, pr the producer, I'm going to stick with citizens awakening to their power. And what I mean is, until we get citizens awakening to their power, the reform on gerrymandering and re reapportionment or money out of politics or ranked choice voting, it's going to be slow if most of us are asleep. So yes, the structural things are critically important but so is awakening to our power. Love that. Okay, um, and our last uh, question, I'm gonna sort of combine three of them. People are asking in the same uh, theme here. Um, so you mentioned what makes a big difference to members of Congress or to their staff, what gets on their radar. So people are wondering, um, I know of course you mentioned that meeting in person really gets their attention. Are there other things that make a big difference? And how does, uh, for, for those in-person meetings, does a Zoom meeting count the same as an in-person meeting? Uh, and if you're struggling to get that in-person meeting, uh, what, what else can you do or what else can make an impact oh, on those offices? Okay, great, a lot of questions here. Um, so yeah, the, the more you can get people who have the members of Congress's ear on board, again, who's the biggest employer in the district? Uh, who is the mayor of the largest cities in the district? Uh, who is a religious leader in the district that they might pay attention to? So those kinds of things are, are really important. Um, uh, yeah, face-to-face -face on Zoom is uh, really matters. On what if I can't get the meeting? So let me give a couple of tools. One of the things I urge people to do is um, find some, go on their website, on their news releases, and find a news release about something they've done they're excited about and you're excited about, and write letters to the editor thanking them for that thing and hoping they bring that same commitment and leadership to your issue. And so and in a, a kind of public but positive strokes kind of way, saying, oh boy, these people, it's not those seven, 
they're talking to the whole community and talk to the whole community in a very positive way uh, on specifics that they love and you want to bring them over to something that you love. Did I miss something in those questions? That's it. You okay. got it. Um, right. And I'm going to hand it back to Stephanie now. Great. Thank you, Flannery. And thank you all for the questions. Clearly, this is a topic many of us are, are passionate about, concerned about. Um, so thank you for, for fielding those questions, Sam. Uh, I want to just end this with a, a quote from the afterword, which we're showing on the slide here so everyone can follow along that I just, I particularly resonated with it. I had to stop and reread it about three times when I first came across it. And you say, engaging in transformational advocacy is a tall order, but what is at stake is the quality of life on this planet and perhaps life itself. There are two competing visions of who we are as people and our ability to change the world for the better. One sees individuals as timid, inadequate, inconsequential, just not up to the job. The other sees people as inherently strong, committed, brave, visionary, audacious, and heroic, capable of much more than we imagine. How do you see people? How do you see yourself? Thank you again, Sam, for putting this question to us, um, for being here today and reminding us to see ourselves as the committed, capable climate heroes we really are. Great. Thanks so much. And folks should go to reclaimingourdemocracy.org to find out how they can participate in other ways. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you Sam. Now it's my pleasure to invite Tony Serna, Vice President of Organizational Strategy for CCL, to the Zoom stage for an update on our elections work and how exactly we might go about reclaiming our democracy this year. So Tony, back over to you. Great, thank you, Stephanie. One of the best things about my job at CCL is that I get to scan the horizon looking for opportunities for us to make a big impact and then focus my attention on bringing those opportunities to all of you. And in 2024, engaging in elections is a big opportunity for CCL to elevate climate as a top issue for candidates and elected officials up and down the ballot and in every political party. It might sound surprising that we, as a nonpartisan organization, are engaging in election work, but we're doing it in a nonpartisan way. Our CCL election work does not have the goal of putting a particular party or a particular candidate in power. Instead, we're doing this work to put the issue of climate change itself higher on the priority list for both political parties and for every candidate running for office. So I'm going to quickly go through why we should engage and how we'll get engaged. But if there's only one thing you take away, it's this. Please join the Election Engagement Action Team at cclusa.org slash election dash engagement. That's where you'll get all the updates about our election work and opportunities to get involved. Okay, so why is CCL engaging in elections at all? Well, first, who gets elected matters. Electing more climate supporters and more climate champions in both parties means passing more climate legislation and lowering emissions. Plus, candidates pay attention, to, pay attention to voters. This is a chance for us to make our voices heard and amplify the voices of the millions of people who support climate action. And candidates pay attention to the organizations that can turn out the vote. By showing that we can turn out voters, you and CCL more broadly will have more clout in our lobbying efforts. And last, it's a chance for community engagement. This can be an opportunity to raise awareness, persuade people about the importance of climate action, and potentially even recruit people to CCL's work. Now, you may be saying, ugh, can we just wait until November? Unfortunately, no, because 83% of members of Congress are in safe seats and are essentially elected in the primaries. That means, for example, if someone's district or state is overwhelmingly Democratic, the Democratic candidate that wins the primary election is all but guaranteed to win the general election. Same thing for Republican districts or states. If an area is overwhelmingly Republican, whoever wins the primary election will likely go on to win the general election. Same is true of many of our local and state officials. So primaries are a time when we can have a lot of leverage. Again, we can help elect the better climate candidate within a party, and this is really key. We're not trying to elect one party over another. By engaging in the primaries, we can try to elevate the most climate-friendly candidate within a party. We can also use the primaries to turn people into regular voters. When people vote in the primaries, they almost always vote in the general election. And this is a reminder that politicians really care about their base voters, those who vote in primaries. Okay, so what are we gonna do? We've got seven things on our list. Uh, election season tabling, social media, town halls and candidate forums, getting out the CCL vote, working with the Environmental Voter Project, postcarding to get out the vote and relational organizing. So let's dig in. Uh, tabling, chapters should be including election materials when tabling starting now. We've got flyers for getting registered, reminding people to vote and even volunteering with us. We'll put a link to our election season tabling kit in the chat. 
We've also got yard signs, shirts, and buttons that you can wear while tabling. Then we've got social media. We've got a whole social media kit, including a ton of graphics that individuals and chapters can use on all the platforms. We'll put a link to our social media kit in the chat as well. And then on town halls, we are also going to get out there during the campaign and engage candidates directly, bring people to their events, ask questions about climate. That will push the candidates to study up and be ready with an answer on climate change and make sure they know the public cares about the issue. Plus, campaign events are a great time to engage people in your community who care about politics. We'll put a couple links in the chat about how to get involved in town halls. Next up, make sure to get everyone in your chapter to vote. This is a great chance to reach out to your, to your roster and re-engage people who have been quiet, or have a party where people get together to look at sample ballots or make a plan on how to vote. And don't forget the chapter development lever. You know, this is, you know, for more information on this, you can see our recent training uh, webinar that includes everything on getting out the CCL vote. Okay, now let's talk about our partnership with the Environmental Voter Project, or EVP. Here's the one big problem. People who care about the climate don't vote as often as they should, and then climate shows up as a lower priority in polling. And the solution is to get climate supporters to become regular and reliable voters. CCL does some of this work directly, but we don't have nearly the infrastructure, experience, or expertise that an organization like EVP has in doing this work. So by partnering with them, we can leverage their capacity with voter mobilization to help CCLers' time and energy go much further. EVP is targeting 4.8 million climate or environment first voters in 19 states. These are people who are already registered, who care about the climate, but they're unlikely to vote. So how will we do this? We're gonna be having C weekly CCL phone banking with EVP every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern and 4 p.m. Pacific. Just show up with your phone and computer and we'll train you to make calls to environmental voters and help get them to the polls. Look in the chat for how to sign up for future phone banks. What else? We're going to be postcarding with EVP. Uh, we'll help them send handwritten postcards to hundreds of thousands of potential voters. If you join the action team, I'll make sure that you know when and how to get involved with EVP postcarding. We even hope to make this a chapter action in late summer. Now I want to let you hear directly from EVP founder and executive director Nathaniel Stinnett about why 2024 is such an important time for CCLers to get involved with EVP. We at the Environmental Voter Project are so lucky to be able to partner with so many incredible CCL members. And as we begin 2024, I'd like you to consider the following. One, as CCL members, you care deeply about the climate crisis and you recognize why it's so important to build political will for climate solutions. This is what CCL is about, right? Two, this year, 2024, this year may be the single biggest inflection point ever for building that political will for climate solutions. So this is a crucially important moment in time for you and for us. Three, we at the Environmental Voter Project have an additional way to achieve it in addition to your great work at CCL. As I just said to you, EVP has identified 4.8 million low propensity climate first voters across 19 states and will have easy weekly opportunities for you to volunteer with other CCL members to turn these non-voters into brand new climate voters. These are easy, nonpartisan, proven scripts that you'll be using. And finally, time is of the essence. Every winter and spring primary election is a golden opportunity to start talking with these voters. So please consider this your invitation to join us. This is your opportunity to make a difference in 2024. And I want to thank you ahead of time for being part of this work. It's such an honor to work with you. And I, I can't wait to see you on the phone banks this year. Now, if that wasn't inspiring enough, I want to I want you to hear from a CCLer who's been volunteering with EVP for years, Craig Preston, one of CCL's California State Coordinators and a leader of CCL's National Conservative Outreach Action Team. Craig, I'd love to hear about your history with EVP and why you're so inspired by their work. Great. Thank you, Tony. Glad to be with you all. 
Uh, I joined EVP uh, a few years ago. It happened as CCL began to uh, promote e EVP's work. I was inspired by seeing how we need partnerships. I've been in CCL over 10 years, but there's a lot of work to do, and some people already have an infrastructure. So I started volunteering as on phone banks, but then I started to see CCLers that are busy people. And there's a saying, if you want to get something done, find busy people. And so I see these people that are very active in their chapter, and they're not only joining phone banks and leading phone banks through EVP. And so I decided to get out of my comfort zone and lead some phone banks through EVP. Um, what a joy. I I've, I've found as I would then contribute that way, uh, learn some new skills, how to run a Zoom meeting like we're on right now, and that we could uh, get people from around the country to make such a big difference in strategic places where these climate-friendly voters that just don't have a propensity for voting yet just need a little push. And it was such an easy phone call to make. Loved it that uh, we're calling with our CCL values to say thank you. We say thank you for being a registered voter. And by the way, did you know Tuesday is an election? Do you need any help to get to the polls and any information? And it was such an easy phone call to make. So just loved being a volunteer and inspiring people to do that type of work. Um, and now I see an EVP doing it throughout the year that they find these little elections to move these these uh, voters to get uh, active. So I encourage you to consider joining the action team. As Tony said, I lead the conservative outreach action team. We uh, obviously are trying to bring more conservatives in our movement, bipartisanship, I'm doubling down on bipartisanship. We want strong elections and strong legislation. It took a long time to get some things done like Social Security and Medicare, bipartisan things like the Clean Air Act. And I think we can do this, but we need both sides of the aisle working on it. So please join EVP because I love how they reach out to voters wherever they are, and we work with whoever gets elected. And so I'm inspired once again to lead and uh, join EVP and what they do. Please join me. Thank you so much, Craig. That's amazing. Okay, there's a couple more things I want to share quickly here. One is that since EVP does not work in every state, we will be supporting postcarding to get out the vote in some of the other states because this work is so important everywhere. Many state coordinators have already signed up to do this and they will need your help in organizing postcarding parties. And I also wanna mention that our CCL higher ed team organized by Stephanie is working with our higher ed volunteers on relational organizing. This basically means talking to friends and family about how important it is to get registered and vote and how it is important that they consider climate when they vote. We'll put a link in the chat with more info from the higher education team. And again, the one thing I want you to take away from this, join our work with the Election Engagement Action Team at cclusa.org slash election dash engagement. I'll give you all the updates. There'll be so many different ways that you can get involved, ask your questions. We're so excited to have you there. And back to Stephanie. Well, thank you so much, Tony, for organizing all of that. Thank you to Craig for being such an avid supporter of EVP and for getting more and more of our CCLers to do those calls, to do that postcarding. I'm just so thrilled that we're all focusing on elections this year and um, really excited about the higher ed partnership with our national youth action team to, to really get out the youth climate vote as that's gonna be so important. So let's look at what's ahead of us in this month of February. Let's take a look at some of those key actions you can start taking. Before we jump into the action sheet, I wanna share that and amplify that it is Black History Month. Now this is a time to honor and celebrate black leaders, educators and change makers both past and present. Now we celebrate Black History Month as a space of learning, reflection, and continuous support of Black culture, contributions, and leadership locally and globally. Take some time today to learn about the rich and dynamic history and go out and support your local Black businesses and leaders this month. You can follow CCL underscore inclusion on Instagram for more information on all things inclusion here and consider joining the Diversity and Inclusion Action Team's next meeting on February 26th. I want to say an extra special thank you to Minerva Jean and our inclusion action, uh, our inclusion team and the climate and culture action team for your leadership in building a more inclusive climate movement, not just during Black History Month, but all year round. So let's dive into the action sheet. Now your members of Congress will be working in their district or state offices during the last week of March and the first week of April. So go ahead and start planning now to visit the office with some sort of drop off to show your MOCs that there is strong support for climate policies in your district or state. If you're struggling for some ideas of what you might drop, here are a few. You might bring a bunch of signed constituent letters or a thank you card or a photo signed by your chapter members. If you've been gathering constituent letters about the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, 
or if you've written some at your chapter meetings, this is the perfect time to swing by that local office, drop those off, and show them that Carbon Fee and Dividend has lots of local fans. You could also plan to drop off a folder of newspaper clippings, letters to the editor, op-eds, and earned media coverage of your chapter, showing that climate change and your climate advocacy is really driving local conversation. You could bring a summary of support from community leaders or a creative idea of your own, such as home-baked goods, kids' drawings, or postcards. They really love that. Showing the climate change and your climate advocacy is driving more of that local conversation once again. And all of these ideas and more are on the February action sheet, so you can start planning to make that March drop-off a success. As we just heard from Tony, this is a great time to help get voters out for the primary elections. There are election engagement opportunities available with the upcoming primaries that are going to help us push climate change higher on the priority list for everybody running for office, Republican and Democrat alike. The action sheet has all sorts of supportive links and information to help you get started, as well as an election season social media toolkit. So definitely take advantage of all of those resources. And if you really want to dive in, join that election engagement action team. And finally, write to Congress to help preserve the climate funding in the Farm Bill. In 2022, the Inflation Reduction Act allocated $20 billion to climate smart farming and forestry. When Congress works on the Farm Bill this year, they could lock in that funding. But early negotiations show that these funds may actually be in jeopardy of getting reallocated elsewhere. So this month, please send a quick email to your members of Congress asking them to protect that climate funding in the Farm Bill. Our February action sheet has a link to our action tool, as well as talking points you can practice so you're comfortable with these topics. And last but certainly not least, don't forget that our Conservative Climate Leadership Conference and Lobby Day is currently accepting applications. It is coming up so quick. It's going to be March 19th through the 20th in Washington, DC. So if you are one of our Right of Center volunteers, or you know someone in your network who is Right of Center and would be interested in this event, please apply or share the link. Now that brings us to the end of our action sheet. As you can see, there are lots of ways to step up in your climate advocacy. I like to say that climate advocates are made, not born. So go out there and keep building up your skill sets to be stronger climate advocates this February. Thank you all. Gracias a todos for joining us and for inspiring each other to aim higher and believe we can do the impossible to create a livable future for all of us. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.